Welcome to the series Writing for Games. In this video, I'm going to cover quests, main quests and scenarios. Let's review what we've talked about so far. Quests impose structure, provide writing, and suggest meaningful actions to players. There are different types of quests a player might undertake within a world. They might eliminate certain things, get certain things, or otherwise protect or escort certain things. And these provide a variety and allow a player to choose what they want to do within a world. At the same time, they impose a certain amount of structure. They allow a character, as portrayed by a player, to do things within a world. They also suggest meaningful actions. They allow players to shape how they want to play. They can choose some actions over other actions based on either explicit rewards, what a quest might suggest the reward is, or more implicit worlds of completing certain tasks in certain ways. Let's think, though, and shift our thinking at the same time towards main quests. What is the difference between a side quest and a main quest? Principally, the main quest propels the central plot. We can take on side quests to maybe help out a farm, maybe defeat a creature, or otherwise help small things. A bit of a region, a town, a farm, or something like that. Whereas within that same structure, the main quest might be save a country, save a world. They propel the central plot. There might be some side things going on, but the main quest, almost always labeled such, is a grander scale. We are saving a planet, saving a country, saving a world, and by completing tasks associated with the main quest, we're propelling the central plot. So let's reflect again on our quest parts. We have characters. Who does this affect? Are we rescuing a princess? Are we defeating a dark lord? What exactly are we doing? Who does it affect? Also, what tasks are we doing? As noted previously, there's lots of different types of quests. What exactly are we doing? Are we getting a certain number of things, destroying a certain number of things? What does this mean? At the same time, what prevents us? Do we need to fight particular enemies? Do we need to overcome certain financial limits? Do we need to collect a certain amount of resources? What exactly is preventing us from immediately completing this goal? And then finally, as mentioned, what is the reward? What happens as a result of this main quest? If we're out to save a country, what does that mean? Are we defeating a certain number of generals, defeating a dark lord? Are we collecting money to pay off a debt or any other thing? What exactly do we get as a result of this? What are we trying to see? As we think about these, let's pair them with thinking of things now in a flowchart. So the main quest, if we were to graph on a flowchart from beginning to end, we would have the quest start and the quest goal. We would end with the goal being completed. However, games are really rarely that straightforward. We often have much more complexity in there. We don't generally start the game and then immediately finish the game. There's more complexity and definitely more tasks. Remember, an aspect of quests is what are we doing and what are we attempting to overcome or what prevents us from achieving those goals. So if we were to graph a general game like this, a much more fantasy set game, or a structure that's not too reminiscent from a Legend of Zelda series, we might have the quest start, we might need to persuade three different goddesses or get their blessings somehow. We may need to get an ancient sword or acquire some type of ancient weapon. And then finally, we destroy the Dark Lord. As mapped here, notice we have different steps. It starts, we are doing three different things. We are doing a next thing, and we are doing a next thing. Each of which maps to the previous types of quests, right? Destroying or getting or persuading. Put in this way, notice that there is a series of progression. We're still doing that exact line, request start to quest goal, but what we're doing in between is propelling the story forward at different points. In fact, if we think of it as kind of different points, that will help us understand the next example. So in the game Pathologic 2, there's lots of different things you can do. The game is divided up in different acts that give you additional information and you can complete different tasks, but only certain actions progress the story. And these are highlighted as bigger icons within the kind of mental map it provides to you. So as you play the game, you understand certain actions within certain contexts will propel the story forward. At the same time, there are also side quests, side events, side tasks you can do, additional information you can collect, but only certain actions propel that story forward. So as we're thinking about a main quest and propelling the story forward, we can also think about a main quest as establishing story-driven checkpoints. So we're talking about game design and development. 
So principally, if we were talking about writing a story, there might be certain quests that need to be done. We are might have our hero meet the wizard, get the sword, and having written on the page, that might take up 20 pages or 30 pages or 50 pages or 100 pages or maybe an entire book. Within a game, though, we often establish story-driven checkpoints where the mechanics of the game meet the story of the game. In these points, the checkpoint asks the player to perform a particular action. Or put another way, we might think of them as mechanical checkpoints or mechanical gates, in that the player needs to demonstrate a certain mastery of a particular mechanic at that particular checkpoint. So, for example, we might ask the player, via the character early on, to complete a certain number of sword maneuvers, and then we might have quests connect those sword maneuvers. And then, as part of a boss fight that indicates a story-driven checkpoint, we might then have a boss fight that then asks them to perform multiple sword maneuvers in connection to each other, so that the player is learning these maneuvers as the character is, and then we're establishing a story-driven checkpoint in which all those maneuvers are needed. So if we think about kind of side quests as a, as a collection to or in parallel to complementing a main quest, then we can start to think a little bit about story urgency. What allows or prevents side quests? Is there a time limit based on the main quest? Does it need to be completed in three days, two days, or two weeks? Or is there no urgency at all? Often we find in the Elder Scrolls games that there's very little story urgency. The character, as driven by the player, can go off and do a bunch of other things, and then when they're ready, they can take on the main quest. And this is often true of very large role-playing games, where often there's very little story urgency. So what prevents side quests? Generally nothing. And the player can take on lots of variety of things. At the same time, some games put resource limits or resource requirements as associated with side quests in connection to a main quest. That is, there needs to be a certain gathering of allies, gathering of resources, or gathering of power requirements, a level requirement in other words, before they can take on that story-driven checkpoint. This is often very common in much more action-oriented games. For example, if we were to map this in our previous example of what needs to be done throughout a main quest, we might think of it as different leveled progression. Each one is a story-driven checkpoint to the next thing. In order to move to persuade the goddesses, you need to be level 10 plus. Maybe you can sneak by if you're very good as a player and get your character to perform certain actions or certain maneuvers, but generally you need to be at least 10 plus, and then 20 plus, 30 plus, and then 40 plus to finally destroy the Lark Lord. Now maybe the character level is much higher than that at these different kind of gates or checkpoints, in which case it might be an easier time, or if they're less, it might be a harder time but they serve as story-driven checkpoints, in which, again, you might be able to progress if you're a lower power requirement, but it might be easier if you have a higher power requirement. Put into a game, in fact, Borderland 3 does this. It explicitly lists the minimum level to take on certain quests, and that includes both the main missions, the kind of main quest, as well as side missions. And you can see, when selecting each one, what the corresponding level is. In fact, for this one, bad reception, it says side mission, so a side quest, and the corresponding level next to it. Again, giving power requirements, level requirements, for progression through the game. In order to meet the next story-driven checkpoint of the main mission, you need to be at a certain level. If you're not at that certain level, you might consider go fighting enemies or go taking on other side missions, side quests, to gather enough, gather enough resources to then meet that checkpoint and then progress the story. You can also think in a similar way of Alan Wake 2, which is a little less action-driven than Borderlands 3, but has a similar idea. As you move throughout the world in the two different main characters, you will collect different clues to the different murders and different kind of online storylines that are going on. As you collect these, they add more information that are arranged within this mind, mind palace arrangement, but you can always collect more clues than you need to progress to the next point in the story. You can learn lots of information about the world through lots of different clues, but there is a minimum required for progression. So there is a checkpoint that you need to reach, a certain quantity you need to reach in order to progress. You need to have found certain clues to progress the story. Similar to as we think about it in a different resource, 
of Borderlands 3. You need to be at a certain level to take on main missions or they're too complicated or too hard. In which case, you need to go ahead and collect those resources, build up those levels, taking on side missions or side quests, and revisit it. Very similar to Alan Wake 2, where you need to click a, collect a certain number of clues or certain very specific clues, arrange them to progress the story. So how do we think about main quests? They complete two main things. First, they propel the central plot. The main quest propels the central plot. The side quest may help fill out the world, might give us more information, might give us better resources, better levels, but whatever the main quest is, it is propelling the central plot. At the same time, it establishes story-driven checkpoints. There might be act breaks, act one to act two. There might be scene breaks, scene one to scene two, but they serve as some kind of checkpoint associated with generally the mechanics of the game. You need to have com completed a certain number of tasks. You need to gather a certain number of resources. You need to have a certain level all of which serve as checkpoints that allow the player to access the next part of the game. So again, as we think in game terms, these are story checkpoints or story-driven checkpoints that are connected to mechanical goals. Not only are we propelling the central plot as if it was a kind of longer written work in a novel, but we're also connecting it to the mechanics of the game. What does a player need to demonstrate mastery of to access the next part of the story? story-driven checkpoints, as well as propelling the central plot simultaneously as part of the main quest. Thanks for watching.